so welcome on this event about the, the, the sense of sustainability. That's the today's question. Um, this is an event organized by uh, Radboud Reflects uh, and the Sustainability Program Board of the uh, Radboud University. And uh, this is the fourth uh, in a series of double lectures in which sustainability uh, plays a, a role. And we thought in this, uh, uh, so the last uh, event this, uh, this year, uh, why not reflect on sustainability itself? Uh, is this a, a concept that helps us, that's feasible? Um, uh, what are we doing when we are sustaining our lives, our businesses? Um, so that's the, the, the question um, for tonight. And I myself uh, kept thinking about this quote from Lewis Carroll, um, from one of the books uh, in which Alice plays a role, I think it's Alice Through the Looking Glass, um, in which she, Alice meets Humpty Dumpty. And he uses words in a very strange way. He, 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 he does what he wants with them. And this is the quote. Um, when I use the word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That's all. So maybe the question tonight, who masters uh, sustainability or uh, uh, what's happening when we're talking about sustainability? Uh, what's this concept that um, we use in very different ways, uh, and that does very real things, um, but that means so many different things. We have asked two uh, speakers here uh, tonight to elaborate on this. Uh, we've asked uh, philosopher, philo philosopher laureate uh, René Ten Bos and uh, um, a professor of philosophy at this university uh, to, to get us to grips with this concept and get into uh, what it, not only what it means, but how, how we use it and um, um, if, if, if it takes us anywhere. We've also asked marketing expert uh, Vera Blasevic, uh, assistant professor marketing at this university, uh, to get into uh, businesses, uh, sustainability and businesses, because that's where it all seems to be uh, happening. But what do we, what's happening when we sustain businesses? And um, how does it, work in practice. So that's the two topics. Um, they will give a, a lecture of about 20 minutes uh, each and afterwards uh, we'll have a short discussion. Uh, I will chair this discussion. Uh, I'm Lisa Dulans, program manager at Radboud Reflects. And in the last 15, 20 to 15 minutes, we also invite you to uh, join in the discussions and uh, uh, in discussion and uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so that's the program uh, for tonight. Um, I would like to ask our first speaker, René Ten Bos, uh, to start. Give him a warm welcome. Good evening. Um, what I will try to do is given also the title of this evening, the sense of sustainability, to bestow some sense to this concept of sustainability. I will act um, more or less as a philosopher, ask myself what is a philosopher to make of such a concept. And it starts with some, yeah, you know, uh, feelings of baffled, that, that, that you are baffled by the popularity of the concept, uh, in, in the sense that, 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 that nobody dares to cast some doubts on sustainability. Uh. If, for example, you claim that you are against sustainability, then you are completely out of bounds. Uh, and then there is something uh, radically wrong with you. Or to, uh, so, so, so uh, if I, for example, would start my lecture here with the idea that sustainability is deeply wrong, then uh, I will probably end up completely marginalized during this evening. So there is there's, there's something very strange about the concept, eh? uh, it, 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 in, in the sense that it's very difficult 
to be against it, and uh, and while uh, at the same time it, it, uh, it, it that's, that's at least my position. It is also very difficult to be completely enthused by it. Yeah, and and um, so, so what's wrong with the concept? I'm not saying that the, the comportment or behavior that should guide the concept is wrong, but I'm suggesting that the concept functions in a particular kind of way. I will come back to that later. Um, when we go back to the Brundtland uh, definition of sustainability, yeah, it, it's also very clear, I published quite a lot on this, um, it, it's also very clear that, that, that this relates to a concept of time. Eh? There is talk about generations and the need of present generations uh, are fulfilled, but it should be fulfilled not in a way as to compromise the needs of future generations. And if you look at this from a philosophical perspective, then all sorts of questions uh, start to pop up. First question here is, basically uh, are the needs of present generations and uh, being taken care of in a proper way. And the second uh, question here is, if we are not even capable of taking care of the needs of present generations, uh, who are we uh, to, uh, to claim that we might be capable of taking care of the needs of future generations? Now, this, these are all well-known well -known, uh, discussions. Uh, when it comes to the concept of sustainability, and 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 um, as always, people have always harbored doubts about uh, what is being promised, especially by this uh, Brundtland uh, uh, Commission. Um, interestingly, uh, the underlying tone here. So if we are talking about sense of sustainability, is always also a tone of optimism. And what I will try to make clear, and by the end of my lecture I will come back to that, is that, that, that this optimistic undertone is completely absent from ecological discourses or uh, discourses in, in academia on climate change, on, on extinction, and so on. So, so um, this optimism is, is very interesting, and perhaps we can come back to that later. I have um, I've been repeatedly asked what I think about optimism, and um, I will have probably the opportunity to come back to this. But, but uh, in general, I can only say that I'm way more optimistic about pessimism than about optimism. So, so that, that's, that's just uh, a point that I would like to make. Uh, so just some preliminary remarks here on, on, on sustainability. And it should be quite clear that I'm not completely convinced of the concept, whereas at the same time, it's very difficult to be against it. Well, um, <clears throat> how does this concept function in all sorts of discourses? First of all, it is a discourse that is highly popular in, in managerial circles, in organizations, in companies, and so on. I'm not uh, claiming that this is all basically mumbo jumbo or bullocks or something like that, eh? but, but there is at least something that is triggered in me and that makes me a, kind, a bit uh, careful about uh, uh, the concept of sustainability, um, because yeah, it is uh, embraced precisely by those who are generally, or who stand generally accused of, of, of causing all the mishap or all the problems that are uh, taking place, and that should um, cause, I think, some suspicion. Um, I generally think that there are three ways in, in which sustainability as a concept, eh, I'm not talking about the behavior, but as a concept, eh, plays a role in all sorts of debates. Eh. The first role uh, is, is rest, eh, um, ties in with, with uh, what you might refer to as uh, rest, restoration. In, in fact, eh, we, use a, um, um, we, we use a lot of um, 
I'm a bit distracted now because of what happens over there, sorry. Uh, but but um, the concept of uh, sustainability is a concept that, that also borders on a certain kind of melancholia. And this kind of melancholia, I try to, um, uh, to um, link to, to the use of words in the sustainability discourse, we start with the prefix re, re. My name is René, so probably it's a kind of self-hate here, but, 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 um, uh, but, but nevertheless, eh, you, you always see this, this, this idea of eh, something needs to be restored. This is the restorative aspect of the discourse on sustainability, eh, as I define it. Eh? So there is a kind of logic of return. Eh? Think here of uh, a logic of reversal, eh, or eh, and, and words that are used eh, and that you uh, frequently encounter are words like rewilding. So as if nature has been emptied due to, let's say, modernization or technology and so on, and now we finally start to mend our ways, and all of a sudden we can bring back nature. Eh? mightily enthused by the idea of the wolf who is coming back to this country. Uh, um, all the other words, like, not, not just rewilding, but also words like revitalization, recuperation, and so on, you, you frequently encounter them in this discussion. And it is uh, as, as if you can go back in time. I'm not clearly suggesting that there is some sort of pristine uh, uh, past eh, to which we all long, but, but, but the, 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 the use of words starting with this prefix, uh, re, um, makes me a bit wary, suspicious as well. <coughs> we want to restore apparently what generally uh, has been destroyed. And, and um, Okay, interesting. Now, one note I should make beforehand, if you talk to ecologists, or if you talk to, uh, 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 for example, extinction biologists and so on, they simply argue that this uh, restorative logic is simply not available anymore. There's a big difference here in, in, in let's say, academic scientific discourses and perhaps managerial resources to which Vera will probably, uh, of, about which Vera will probably say a bit more later. There's also an, uh, something, and, and, and here I have, and this is the second R of sustainability. The first one is restoration. The second is uh, uh, rudimentary. And what I mean by rudimentary is that uh, something doesn't develop anymore like in medicine and so on, if you talk about a rudimentary organ, then it's an organ that doesn't uh, uh, develop itself anymore, it doesn't grow anymore. And in this sense, I think that this concept of, um, of, of uh, sustainability has the same problem. Eh? Um, my favorite philosophers, of, one of my favorite philosophers is Gilles Deleuze, and he once argued that a concept should always be an adventure. And, he, and what he meant by this is, is that this concept should constantly undergo semantic shifts. If you read good philosophy, then you see that all sorts of concepts are being introduced, but that nevertheless these concepts are constantly changing because people want to experiment with this. Now, as far as I'm concerned, eh, when we talk about the concept of uh, uh, sustainability, you hardly see any changes. It is as if this definition, once phrased by the Brundtland Commission in 1988, is st it still holds sway. Eh, I read analysis of the German uh, word for, for sustainability, Nachhaltigkeit. There's some debate on when this concept was invented and so on. Eh? Uh, several sources are available here. But there is hardly any development in the concept as well. And that makes me suspicious as well. It is as if the idea as such doesn't 
allow people to um, um, mentally experiment anymore. It is as if we should embrace it as a kind of uh, religious or holy token, eh? and 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 um, and that kind of belies uh, the idea that we experiment. I know, of course, that there are a lot of uh, 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 practices that are being uh, developed and, and by by businesses, especially by small and medium-sized businesses, and so on. But nevertheless, do we? think about this concept and especially do we think about this concept in such a way as to make it more resonating or more tying in with, with what is going on in these aforementioned sciences like ecology and so on. I will come back to that. There is also, uh, uh, this is my third R on the sustainability, there is also some rabbit kind of um, 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 uh, thing about sustainability, uh, an element of, of uh, enthusiasm, an element of, of uh, a certain zeal that is involved, uh, and this ties in with what I said in the early stages of this lecture, that, that is, if you are against it, uh, then you, you must be out of your mind somehow. This enthusiasm uh, I frequently encounter when I visit uh, seminars on sustainability or when I go to companies or departments of, of the government and so on. Uh, everybody is so enthused by the idea of sustainability that, that, um, that, that, that I start to harbor misgivings about it. Why? Am I in such a way? Because um, it is clear that sustainability is, from an ethical perspective, clearly on the side of the good. And it does not want to discuss even the question whether it's good. So to be sustainable is uh, something that comes close to what it means to be politically correct. And what I just want to bring in here tonight is um, what do we s think about this political correctness? Eh? Even uh, the, 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 the well-known polluters in the world and the big uh, fossil-based industries and so on somehow do not dare to, uh, to, to, to jettison this concept of sustainability. Eh? And political correctness has been defined by the Italian philosopher Mario Perniola uh, as as, as uh, militia sine malicia, uh, meaning uh, you, 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 you are militant, but at the same time you do not want to hurt people. In a similar vein, philosophers like uh, uh, Slavoj Zizek have criticized the concept of sustainability as well. Uh, it is, uh, Zizek argues, as if uh, sustainability is, is the sort of idea that, that, that uh, allows us to go on with our way of lives um, without uh, uh, too many doubts eh, or too many uh, misgivings about, um, um, what, what, um, ab about our own behavior. So we can go on with our lives, we worry a bit, and we are not, uh, uh, and, 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 but never <coughs> we get, get on with our lives, we worry, eh? but we don't worry too much. And that's the idea. Eh? There are some commentators who have argued that sustainability is the ecological version of uh, the opiate for the masses, uh, which is interesting. And this is what I tie in with this concept of militia sine malicia. So, so you want to be militant, you want to change something, but you don't want to suffer the pain that comes from the change. And that is the idea here. So these were my three R's eh, when I'm discussing sustainability. Eh, there's a restorative logic, there's something very rudimentary about the concept, it doesn't change, and there is some rabid, rabidity, eh, some fanatic, zealous kind of question. Eh? We are all embracing the good stuff. Good. Is this enough to discredit the concept? Uh, I'm simply 
summarizing some of the ideas that I encountered in especially uh, critical literature on on sustainability, but also in 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 uh, in, in ecological uh, literature. Eh? One of the points that 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 strikes me is that when we read in stuff on science and, and, and climatology or oceanography and so on, people don't embrace this idea of sustainability anymore. So something strange here. So um, <clears throat> what is the basic argument that most of these people who are interested in ecology uh, are bringing in against uh, sustainability eh? <clears throat> and one of the underst basic understandings is that, that that sustainability is never discussed eh, from uh, let's say a holistic systemic point of view eh? sustainability is always about what you and I or a given community or a given com uh, uh, um, a, a, a given company organization an institution or even a state can do but what is needed these days is to overcome all these partial uh, approaches um, when we talk about ecological crisis uh, and we have ecological crisis most uh, commentators agree on this and then we need an, an approach that is um, uh, reaching farther than all these partial approaches that is basically uh, the idea uh, uh, I published a book last year on the Anthropocene and the Anthropocene is a, a concept that is used to describe all these cascades of catastrophes that are taking place uh, these days, and most people writing on the subject, and these are not just philosophers, but also scientists, never use the word sustainability. Because they kind of jettison the idea of sustainability precisely because what is needed is a more holistic approach. Or to put it in other words, eh, you, you, you need an... Um, um, you, you, uh, when we talk about these ecological uh, catastrophes, uh, the, the, um, we're talking about earth system sciences. And ecology is simply an obstacle to understand these, uh, sorry, I'm making a mistake here, uh, sustainability or the concept of sustainability is basically an obst obstacle to approaching all these problems from such an earth system kind of perspective. This is therefore a big, big problem here. Yeah. A, a, a big problem. Uh, it is not so much a matter of what you or what a given company or a certain uh, flock of people uh, uh, are doing. Uh, it is basically the idea of what mankind as such is doing. Therefore, uh, the, 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 the big problem in the debate, and this is a problem that is grossly neglect, neglected in, in most literature on sustainability, is uh, about the relationship between parts uh, and wholes. How do we as individuals, as companies, uh, as communities and so on, relate to a whole? Uh, Earth system sciences is what should be brought in. Uh, and will not for uh, I, I like to refer here, for example, to work of the Australian public ethicist uh, Clive Hamilton, who wrote a book, Defiant Earth, uh, very soon available in Dutch translation, who precisely makes this point against sustainability. It thwarts us uh, to understand uh, ecological stuff uh, from a more holistic perspective. Okay. Final point here, what does this say about this concept that we are to suggest here? And if we bring in this idea of the sense of sustainability, and sense has, uh, at least in French, the son, two uh, meanings. And it is the meaning of the word, the concept as well, but it's also a direction. Um, if we want, uh, I, I, I try to, make a plea for um, 
let's say, changing this idea of sustainability, this concept, a little bit in, in, in the way as to ecologize it. We should, therefore, um, try eh, to ecologize sustainability. And if we don't do that, eh, then this will be basically an, uh, an empty vessel, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you, René, for these very inspiring uh, words. And I do agree to some extent, and I do disagree to some extent, so that's great for the start of such, a, such an evening. Um, and I'm also maybe slightly more optimistic than you are. But let me tell you a bit. So I brought uh, some slides, and um, uh, I gave it also a title. Of course, the sense of sustainability. And then what I'm particularly studying are change trajectories. And then I called it here towards a better world. And I did deliberately give it a question mark. Um, and as I'm not as well known uh, as uh, René Ten Bos, I also brought my introductory slide for my person, uh, where you see me in the middle. I'm an assistant professor here at the marketing department, but I only have a part-time position here because I also have a position at the RWTH University in Aachen. I'm German, German by background. And I'm coming, even though I'm at the marketing department, and I know the, that a lot of people might mistake marketing and advertising, so I'm really coming from the strategic hook, and I'm mainly interested in innovation management, and that was also my approach uh, towards sustainability, so I'm especially interested in my research on uh, innovation management and sustainability and how organizations can change uh, through their innovation activities towards sustainability and also how they can co-create this with stakeholders. So in that sense, I'm completely with René that we really need a more systematic systems kind of perspective towards um, sustainability or giving it more sense uh, uh, needs that. And I also have a private life, uh, which you can see down below her. <laughs> and indeed, uh, as we all start with this famous uh, definition by the Brundtland uh, Commission, uh, which is then here the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But I agree with you completely that what does that really mean and what does that, how does it guide organizations, and that's what I'm interested in from my background, but also society, consumers, and so on. How does it really guide us in terms of what practices should we develop to maybe give sustainability a bit more of shape and, and clearness? So I agree there. In the meantime, there have been a lot of other definitions as well, and I won't read them all, but you see that the, that the concept as such um, really is fragmenting into all kinds of disciplines, into all kinds of meanings. Um, yes, they always try to do, to embrace this time concept, this future needs, um, but then what they do and what it means and whether it's only ecological or whether it also means social issues, so uh, economic prosperity, healthy environment, social justice, uh, all these things also come together there. And I think that's also what it makes it so complicated as a concept. So in the end then, especially for organizations, is it then just a buzzword we can question? I mean, looking at all the scandals, uh, Germany had this, uh, and still has this huge uh, uh, VW scandal, but also others uh, um, that have been through the media, Exxon, for example. Um, what does that mean? And I mean, um, VW actually even published then this, um, this advertisement afterwards saying like, yeah, um, Oops, oh, the animation went away. So basically they, um, they were on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which is an important index within the business world, and they were taken off that due to the disaster. And then they published this um, saying like, yeah, we just made a mistake. And, um, and I'm following this scandal quite, quite a lot. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I mean, no one takes responsibility. And in the end, isn't that what sustainability is about? That that we, that we take responsibility over our actions, over what we do. Um, but 
I, I really miss that completely here. So they are all just, you know, uh, um, denying and defying. And uh, there was one manager who then, yeah, was accused, but he never really apologized as well. Not really, not, not from his heart. So that's something that then really leaves organizations and also then society and consumers puzzled. So it is clearly really a management topic. It's important. Uh, so here are some claims, for example, from Air France KLM, uh, is pleased to confirm its leading position as best airline on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Um, this is what they do. So clearly organizations have understood that this is an important concept for them, but also for indeed being the good, the ethical, the, the, um, the good people in this and using it for, in the end, selling, right? So there's pressure from numerous stakeholders here. Um, firms are really expected to take ownership of the externalities they generate. And this is through regulation. This is through the claim that you should have CSR reporting and you should be very detailed in that. You should be on the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index. Investors are more and more asking for the sustainability um, or corporate social responsibility, which is Personally, I think equally. Uh, uh, so the criticism Rene gave for the concept of sustainability can also be applied to the concept of corporate social responsibility. Um, and also some consumers. Uh, so consumer groups, it's coming more that they also ask for these things. And I think that also um, shows these things that we try to um, maybe give other people the responsibility. Um, and also, clearly, there are internal drivers, um, because a lot in the management literature has, has looked at it and says, okay, it strengthens employee identification, and that's better for performance, because again, we like to feel good about the things we do. So therefore, I like if I have an employer that cares about it, especially if I care about it as well. So in the end, it might uh, reduce transaction costs in the more, in the longer run. But then, why then is it still so not really embraced? So we do see the advantages of, of, of the sense of sustainability, and in, in that I mean the, the positive aspects about sustainability. Why then is it still, why are we not further than, than where we are today? And I think it's, it's several things, um, and they all have to do with the complexity of sustainability. And if we really want to embrace that, it's it's not easy, it's not, there are so many issues, there are so many stakeholders coming into play. And the first thing that is really missing is a missing sense of urgency, right? I mean, the next quarter short-term performance indicators is something that is very strongly on my mind if I work in a business. But these, you know, CSR things in the long run and I need to uh, be capable of doing today to ensure tomorrow, that's, this time concept really comes into play here. So there's a missing sense of urgency. Then what we also clearly see in our, uh, in our research as well is even though you now have maybe CEOs like the Unilever person um, and claiming, you know, it's the strategic directive of this organization and we want this, um, we do not really see this being translated into operational practices. So it kind of loses itself on the way down in terms of what do, um, what happens in the daily routines of people working in the organization. Um, and then very clearly, you cannot do this in isolation. So again, this systemic per systematic perspective needs to come into play. Um, because wherever you are, whatever you do, you do source from other countries usually. Um, you do have local communities you might have to take care of and so on. And this is a quote from uh, one of the people that, um, uh, where, um, that we interviewed uh, in one of our projects. So uh, he talked, uh, he, he's a, um, he organizes the uh, supplier relationships. Um, and he had a talk with his sustainability uh, group, so they have a dedicated group for that. And he said, okay, our head of the sustainability group was going to give a presentation on how well everything works with our supplies in China. I told him that is not true. So also there we see that sometimes we're so distant from the things that are happening, especially in large organizations, they might have then a corporate sustainability group, but they don't really know what's all happening. So it needs these people that are 
that it will inform them and that will very um, heavily uh, criticize it and say, no, it's not going okay. It's not all right. Um, and another very important complexity is a missing transparency, I think, which also, again, is is very complex. So we're at the moment doing a, a, a project with a, with a large um, electronics um, producer. And um, there is a person who is very dedicated to making it more real. But he says it's so hard to, into, to look into our supply chain because, yeah, we know who's in maybe the first tier supplier, the second tier supplier, but we then don't know from where they source and from whom they source and so on and what's going on there. And I would really like to know, but it's, it's very hard to get that information. So there is missing transparency of, of where kind of the raw materials really come from if it, if it has a large... Uh, upstream supply chain and how the workers are treated there and then you might have subcontractors and, and so on so and local governments that come into play but you don't really know actually from where from what mine are they exactly sourcing they don't know um, so that is that is something that makes it again very complex and that again shows how important this systematic perspective is um, and a little bit the same holds through for consumers so um, uh, of course, being from the marketing department, we also look at, at this as a very important stakeholder group. So what happens as consumers and, and basically to all of us as individuals is um, that a lot of people claim that they are concerned. They are very concerned. But we do not really see a lot of correlation between these claims and actual behavior. So the moment it, it makes it hard for me uh, the moment that I really need to change my behavior, that I really have to pay more, that I, that I have not as much convenience as I'm used to, mm, maybe not. So that's a lot what we see. So usually they only follow up on these intentions, on these good intentions, if it requires little behavioral change. Also here at the, at the consumer, we see the same thing in terms of missing transparency and missing urgency. So if I do something which I maybe, if I really think about it and make it conscious to myself, it's maybe not that great for the striving for sustainability. Well, the consequences are not very severe right now for me. Um, and I'm not really aware of whom I'm hurting particularly. So I can relatively easily push it to the side. Um, there is basically no payment for harming. I, I don't see, I don't see the, the, the punishment of that, right? So, which is also known as the problem of the tragedy of the commons. So also there we see really complexity going on. And oh, I should go there. So I, I wanted to show you a little bit what we see as the, as the problems in, in kind of fulfilling on the term sustainability. Um, but I also have a bit of a good message because uh, we did a lot of research uh, into this and especially looking at how organizations can then try to initiate a change towards true sustainability or towards more sustainability in its, in its original sense of the word. Uh, so we did several uh, projects and focusing on kind of tr change trajectories, like how can they actually manage to really bring social issues on the agenda of the organizations and thereby try to embrace a change towards sustainability. And this is, uh, this is basically how it works. I know it's quite overwhelming in terms of being full and so on, but um, what we really see is that um, it's not organizations that are concerned about sustainability, not in the beginning. It's really individual people within the organization. So that's what we call here uh, um, actors and kind of pockets of proto-practices, pockets uh, of knowledge, actors dry, uh, driven by really passionate values work. So they really believe in this and wanna, they want to do something better. Uh, so they have a passionate concern about some issue, and it's not sustainability in its, in its greatness or something. It's, it's smaller issues, things they see that are going wrong, like the supplier person who says, no, I have been at the, at, the, at the plants in China and it's not going well, and we need to do something about that. 
So he had that issue, for example. So what they do then is they talk, they raise the issue, they connect sustainability in an understanding that also relates to the business language. Because otherwise, it's very hard to kind of make others aware of it, to kind of form a coalition of the willing, as we say it. And usually, these pockets of knowledge form these coalitions of the willing by encounters of serendipity. So they somehow meet, um, they talk, and then realize there's a person, maybe not directly in my hierarchy chain, but there's a person I can connect to, uh, I can talk about my issue, and I might have a, have a partner in that. So they really seek these partners deliberately, um, usually um, beyond the usual suspects, so again, not up and down their own um, hierarchy chain, but often uh, in a network, uh, within the network of the organization. And then, very importantly, they connect through stories, and I will come to that. Then, that is first internally, but then they often do not have enough support yet. So that's why they seek support, inspiration, and legitimacy through liaising uh, with external partners. So I had one case, it was in the chemical industry, and there was a person saying like, I know whenever um, I have an issue and I can't convince it internally, I go to all these external meetings and I tell, in turn, when I come back, I tell them, but our competitors are doing that. They are concerned about it. So we should do something about it. So they get this legitimacy through liaising with external partners. So when hitting the wall internally, use other stakeholders. And then they sell the issues and they bring the issue on the agenda. And by that, change is started and initiated. So here are just some, uh, some uh, examples of a narrative that we, that we saw in two companies where it worked in company A and it didn't really work in company B. Both started with passionate individuals. Um, it remained local first, but then they used externals to create momentum. They um, uh, connected to, ha to have kind of created a common sustainability narrative, so a common story that they could tell and share. And with that, they managed to get sustainability procedures incorporated into the organization. In contrast, Company B had also several passionate individuals, but they, were not, they did not receive support. They did not work with external stakeholders. They could not create a common narrative. And in the end, they just quit from the organization. They were very frustrated and just quit because they didn't want to work for this organization any longer. So that means they are driven by aspiration, these people. They do value work. Um, they feel a duty to act. So uh, we have quotes here like, I know what is good for Canada. I know what is good and I want to change it. I have a desire to leave things in a better place than I found them. Or another person said, for every step that I take, I always think about whether I could explain that on the 10 o'clock news. Can I look at his country and tell them I did good things for you today? So really shaping their behavior with this in mind. And I think that does give some sense to sustainability or some other called it the pop test, could I tell it in the pop and I would be proud of it, basically. Um, they also, as I said, were extensively what we call working the net. So uh, activists, almost like guerrilla tactics, using a common narrative to form pockets outside their uh, normal organization. And I think I explained that. And then, importantly, why have this common narrative? Why is this common narrative so important? Because what we see is that it makes sustainability, this fuzzy term and the things that are all encompassed and that are in some distant future and not really urgent, it makes it concrete through examples, through little stories that you can retell and that give it importance. So later on, it also has more instrumental and pragmatic goals, but it really um, gives, kind of, gives a little bit of the sense back, I would say. In unsuccessful cases, they, these change agents were not able to, to build that and connect to connect to a broader narrative. So that's what we also clearly see. And if no change agent existed, then some employees felt like, ah, there's really nothing I, I can do. It's not that I can change anything. It's someone else's responsibility. So I'm not sure if I agree with that. There are, you can't say uh, uh, I'm against sustainability. No, I agree that you can say, uh, not say I'm against sustainability, but I see a lot of people who simply don't care. They are neither 
for nor against. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they don't care that you can't say I'm against sustainability, but they don't care that it's the other concerns of their business. Um, so in the end, what we see is this normative element towards social issue selling. Um, they have very strong aspirations. They convert abstract sustainability goals into more tangible uh, goals by using really emotional stories. They do um, kind of um, coalesce with like-minded peers. They leverage external support to create internal momentum. And they really work also with other organizations. So it helps to get things moving. And this is kind of a resourcing strategy, as we call it. Then why is the common narrative so important? Uh, why does it work as a vehicle for external change? Um, because it triggers kind of wider change. So a discourse gets started. Um, so they can also convince stakeholders of issues. And what I've frequently heard is that, yeah, but we alone cannot do anything about the conditions, for example, especially in, more, in the more social part of sustainability. We cannot, we don't have the power to change anything. But the moment they team up with other organizations, they get more power and then they can change some things. So while doing that, they synchronize different time regimes also of partners in terms of this short-term versus long-term regimes, and therefore um, create more social movement. So what I want to kind of end with is that despite all the complexities and, and the problems that we see with the term sustainability and with the sense of sustainability, um, I think that there are also a lot of pockets of knowledge forming, like I said, that some organizations are on the way, others are not, they don't care, and they use it uh, uh, for, as a label, but they don't really do anything, so clearly we see that. But quite some organizations are concerned about it and take it serious, the same as on the individual side. And I think the good thing is that it gets a discourse started, like we do here today. Um, to create awareness and then maybe to initiate a more virtuous circle of all the different levels playing together than to, in the end, come up with a more holistic, um, systematic kind of view on it, because I completely agree it needs that, but how do we get there? And I think we get there by having parts that do something. And then indeed, we need to relate to the whole, and we need to, to connect with each other and so on, but we need to start somewhere, because if we always just say, yeah, it's a more holistic problem, it's, it's a wider problem, then we, we defy responsibility. And I think that is something I disagree with you um, here. Okay, thank you. Let's discuss some. <laughs> um, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that there's one thing um, that's lacking mostly uh, that's needed very much uh, for organizations to become sustainable and we all to become sustainable and that is uh, transparency and I know uh, Renee that you're you're uh, somewhat critical about transparency so now to uh, to get into the discussion I would like to uh, first tackle this, so maybe you could elaborate mm -hmm. a bit more on why transparency yeah. uh, is an issue. And we need more of it. I personally think that it's simply, especially also for the consumers, uh, the missing transparency makes it hard to, to make sus more sustainable decisions. I mean, obviously, if I go to Primark and buy my clothes there, then it's probably not very sustainable. Uh, and no brand bashing here, but it's just a good example, and there are others. Um, but the problem is that if I buy more expensive or, or, or from organizations that at least claim to do more for their workers and to save the environment, I don't know. It has become so complex and we live in a global, modern world. We can, we can order things on, I mean, just on our smartphone with one touch and we do not maybe think always about that. So if it was more transparent of what does my decision to consume, for example, mean, then it would be, we could take better decisions. We yeah. lack information. That's what I mean with missing transparency. Yeah. And the same for organizations, even those that really try very hard to understand what their supply chain does entail, they don't know. 
So yeah. they cannot take decisions. They cannot act upon that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So so so. So is that the problem? So you, of course, you don't uh, uh, think that that's a, that's the thing. That that's the big problem. That we just don't know enough. That if. Uh, reality would be more transparent, um, we would be able to act better, become better citizens, people. Um. Yeah. Is that it? I have no disagreement. With this. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. What, what is it then that you don't like about the term transparency? Oh, yeah, that, but this, <laughs> that's, a different. that's a different kind of debate. I, I, of course, I know if you define transparency simply as uh, in, in a sense of... Uh, getting access to certain parts of information that you need in order to make a responsible choice, then uh, I have no doubts about that. But, but, uh, but, really? But so, so <laughs> <laughs> because I think I know, no, I, no, know no, no. I know a lot. Um, um, maybe maybe the, 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 the more transparent it would get, the more difficult it would get for me to, to make decisions because I can get a lot of information but that doesn't tell me how I need to act in a specific situation. Um, so I would invite you, René, to get into the ethos of it. So if I know... The if ethos I'm, of transparency. No, the, the ethos of, of, of choosing, of choosing, making sustainable decisions. <laughs> if, if, if it's all transparent, if I, know, um, if I know everything about the supply chain, um, um, the, the, the thing about transparency is, first of all, this is also a concept. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have a lot of concepts, eh? cost per corporate social responsibility, sustainability, transparency. I once produced a PhD, which was on these kinds of managerial concepts. I'm very much interested in them. If you look at uh, the history of transparency and how it was being conceived in, in theology and philosophy, then you see that, that, that uh, transparency always implies a kind of distortion. So transparency is a distortion. For example, eh, you, you take a glass and I look through you, this glass, and I yeah. see your face, but I see it in a distorted way. Um, so so uh, obviously there is never a, 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 a clear see-through. Uh, and, and if we think about transparency, as but clearly Vera is not saying this, is, she's not suggesting this. That's my second uh, remark, that's, yeah. uh, of the first remark. Second remark is, is that, that um, um, is, is related to, to the relationship between uh, transparency and complexity. And um, of course I'm perfectly aware that, that, that any purchase you make is based on a lot of complexities. You don't know precisely what's going on, you don't know precisely, uh, do you know who produced uh, the apparel that you are wearing right now? Nobody knows it, eh? and, and I think that most people are not aware. It's yeah. very difficult to be constantly aware of all things. And there is always this problem, and I'm sure that, uh, that that's, uh, especially given the marketing background at Fairwise, that she's perfectly aware of, of this, and there is always the, 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 uh, an, an, a nagging understanding that complexity creates opacity eh, rather than transparency. Yeah. And, and this is basically how the world is. Uh, in this sense, I, I, I have some doubts about, about transparency, but just in the sense that transparency is clearly not a see-through. Yeah. So as soon as I make visible some issues about, uh, let's say, children labor in, in, in India or, or in, in, uh, in, in, in industries where they produce uh, uh, apparel, then, then it is clearly the, the, the case that I highlight some point, whereas I ignore other point. Yeah. Uh, and th this, this is basically the situation in which a consumer finds itself. Yeah. Him, and, him and, or herself. Yeah. yeah. And the problem, of course, is also, even if I'm aware that maybe this cloth has been produced with child labor, then it's also, it's still not a good choice to say, I, I mean, as an individual, I can then maybe for, try to force the organization to not source from there and, and do something about it. But if I just decide I will not buy it, then this person doesn't have work anymore. I mean, it's not as easy as that. So I completely agree with that, right? This is we, basically an ethical uh, uh, understanding. Yeah. 
Because if, if, if it would be clear, then there would be no ethical choice to be made. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's um, an interesting next point to get in. So to um, that sustainability, um, that making the green choice, we have it here. Wij gaan verduurzaam. So making the green choice um, seems to be... Um, so there seems to be an exactly right choice. So that there would be a, 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 um, a blue light and a, and a red light. So red's wrong and, and green's very right. And um, if I get your lecture right, you say that we that we seem to, we have to think about that um, less uh, in green and red. You know, it's not that. Uh, transparent um, and that sustainability does give a sense of there's an exact right thing to do um, so would you uh, please get into that again so you said religia sine malicia yeah. oh yeah that's a difficult concept yeah. <laughs> I already regret it, that I did it. But, but, please. But, um, yeah but, but, but um, there is this idea that, that as soon as you bring up the notion of sustainability then there is this um, feel that, that, that we are all doing something good. We are all so happy. I really encounter people in, in companies and so on uh, who wear shirts like sustainability is sexy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think here again we, we, we agree on this. Uh, sustainability is a darned hard thing to do. Uh, it is not just sexy. Uh, and we, we, we talked about it when we had dinner tonight. Uh, uh, it, it's always nice to to fly to a, to, to a posh country and to enjoy your holidays over there. It's not sustainable. Um, and and um, the, the problem with, with uh, ethics as far as uh, in, of, in all ethics is it's never precisely clear what is good or bad. It is not a kind of program. And for example, we have this uh, this uh, whole program here in this city, Nijmegen Operation Steenbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you break a stone out of your garden, uh, replace it by a plant, and then uh, all uh, humming bees and so on, they will uh, be attracted by the plant. Okay. And we so, are all very happy eh, because yes. uh, you did something uh, good. we witness at this yes. moment um, uh, uh, mass extinction in terms of certain insects. So people break open the stone and so forth, and, and, and then they are very happy. But yeah. it's seriously, it's fe uh, if you discuss the stuff from an ethical point of view, then you should make clear to these people that this signifies really nothing. Only probably to 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 um, yeah, uh, it's a kind of ointment for the soul, yeah. and and and, um, and 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 that, that's very interesting. I referred to this at earlier occasions as the psoriasis paradox, and so so you have a pile of, of you have a grain of sand, and and uh, if you add another grain of sand to this one grain. Uh, you, 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 somehow, and uh, it is not just a pile of sand, but eventually there is this thing that the more grains of sand you add to it, all of a sudden it turns into a pile. And it's similar to us. Eh? As soon as I take the car, you go back home tonight. I know. Uh, and uh, I, I, I've been driving my car today. Eh? I said, I, we do not intend to do in with uh, the planet. Yeah. And, and but but at the same time we're doing it. We're doing it. Yeah. That that this is the ethical conundrum in which we find yeah. ourselves. But then would you say, Vera, that it's a problem that it's um, that it's supposed to be so very positive, so very green, and that we feel as you there, it's it's like an ointment, so we feel very good being green. Um, is that a problem of of sustainability? Uh, uh, mm. Should it be hard? Should well, it be? Well, I think it's in, in a sense a problem in that we stop there then. That we say, we did good because we did the stain break. Yeah. Um, it's enough for today. I did the stain break. You know, and, and we do not think about the others. Because, of course, it is very hard to think at every decision that we take, what is maybe the more sustainable one. And I don't want to call it green or anything. I mean, if we, if we buy organic uh, uh, um, uh, vegetables from Egypt... 
that's definitely not sustainable. I mean, yeah. again, these are the complexities, of course, in that. So um, it's not even hard to make that one choice, but then we feel like we did something good today, so it's okay to fly to my destination of choice because I did the stain break. So in that sense, it's it's problematic. But of course, then we all still, I mean, we live we live very comfortable lives and we don't want to think about it all the time. And so at the same time, I feel like if at least there is more awareness of these things and if at least people try a little harder and organizations try a little harder in really filling it with with sense, this concept, yeah. then we are at least one step further. That's only one step. It's it doesn't we are by far not not there of what they claim and so on. But we yeah. can do a lot without really losing a lot of the of the things we are so we are used to. progress will only be very slow. Yes. But 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 but, yes. but in the end, there is a change in 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 the discourse. Also, you know, if you would raise because the, of the concept of sustainability, yeah, it, it 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 is generally accepted, and you yeah. can easily see it. And we have this research. People count words also of uh, publications by companies themselves. And if you would raise the issue of sustainability 30 years ago. Uh, you would be uh, regarded as a loony, and and, yeah. and and nowadays you are at least not a loony anymore. Which is, of course, not to say that people really embody uh, the idea or that they embrace the complexities. As what, I try to make clear. What would it claim. mean to really embody the idea? Uh, I was intrigued by what was Vera saying. Eh? You should appeal to the language that business is uh, speaking. Something of the sort you yep. were, were saying. Yes. Um, and and um, if you really embody the idea, then then I think two uh, steps must be taken. First of all, you have to seriously discuss the system in which you are operating, and this system is called capitalism. Word that that wasn't used anymore, but in in uh, Fira's presentation. I saw a word closely related to issues about capitalism, externalities. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes. And, and, and uh, capitalism is a system, as we know, uh, by some uh, notorious commentators, that, 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 that produces externalities. Yes. It's based on the production of externalities. And uh, so that's the first step that must be taken. And the second step that must be taken is that you are clearly capable of, of um, uh, replacing your small business interest uh, with a broader scope, even if necessary at the expense of the logic of business. Yeah. And this is something that I don't see anymore. Yeah. And this why all these businesses are under the suspicion of basically just paying lip service. And greenwashing. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. 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 yeah, because uh, 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 VW had a terrific repute as far as sustainability is concerned, yeah, and the same holds for Enron, to yeah. mention just another oh, organization. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Society of Business Ethics in America was awarding Enron for having their corporate code of conduct in terms of sustainability in order, in good yeah. order, and just a uh, 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 half year later, hell broke loose. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, so um, two steps. So I, I don't think that you can seriously discuss uh, sustainability without uh, having a profound discussion about capitalism. Yeah. Do you agree? I agree. Yeah. I, I have to say I agree because, yeah, that's that's where it all comes from. Indeed, that's why we refer to the externalities in in th that we have created of the, in our systems and in, in how businesses are set up nowadays. Yeah. And, uh, so then, um, so the, 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 you mentioned to take responsibility for externalities. Mm -hmm. But would that also mean not speaking of externalities anymore? So you mentioned we need a more um, holistic approach to sustainability. Um, is it, does that mean that in uh, in this holism there are no externalities anymore? Is that? I would say to come there, we need to speak more about externalities, actually, and 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 indeed become aware of that. And and maybe sometimes, I mean, this again is a very slow emergent process, 
but uh, uh, um, do things that maybe make no business sense at first. But then in the long run, and there's this time regime then again, yeah. in the long run, they do make more sense. But we need then, they, businesses need to trade off these, these time regimes and, and what gives sense to the business. Yeah. Um, but I then uh, change thinking about doing business as well. Is that is that, absolutely? Is I yeah. I mean, I I, um, I was at a talk um, of a CEO of a large German organization, um, and um, everyone was very much oh the CEO is coming right, and he's talking to us, and and I was sitting there getting more and more angry because he talked about his employee as capital assets about how he was angry with regulation that they couldn't squeeze more out of them of their time of how they should become more efficient of and i was sitting there thinking like come on i mean aren't we beyond that is it, i mean and this is just a very small part of sustainability it's his own employees and we're not talking about whether they are sourcing or whatever right it's his own the employees in his organization it's his, his human capital and and it, it was really it was the most capitalistic talk i heard in a long time and i was getting so angry because is that really the sense of business that we see nowadays and we i had thought we were hopefully a little bit beyond that and would you say that maybe we are because that it felt out of, it felt wrong that he was doing it. It felt not not normal anymore. <laughs> well, it, I have to. It was a large room. It was stuffy. The temperature was hot. So I saw all these people sitting there, you know, nodding. And I was like, "Are you tired? Is it the temperature? Are you really agreeing to that?" I don't. I don't think a lot of the people experienced it the way I did. Hmm. They felt like the big CEO was coming. He must be right. That's that's they were nodding. I was very angry afterwards, <laughs> but yeah, I so I don't know if 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 we're there. Yeah. I I don't know. Well, then maybe uh, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah. Well, I, I I would like to add to this uh, just the observation that 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 it's not just uh, about businesses. It's also about politics and and, and so on, because uh, we always have this idea of self-interest. That lies in the way of, of of developing this more systematic uh, approach. You, 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 you know, if, 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 I I went with some of my students to Russia uh, uh, one and a half years ago, and uh, very interesting, eh? because we were talking about the melting down and the waning of the ice, the melting down of the Arctic Sea. And this is generally regarded in uh, Russia as a business opportunity. For us, it's yeah. a serious menace, and 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 um, it's it, it's it's very it's it's very interesting that they look in a completely different way uh, to it, simply because they think that 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 this will open up uh, uh, unprecedented business opportunities. Yes. Yeah, and and um, and you you kept thinking about the Netherlands, uh, and we keep thinking about drowning. these low countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Jeremy Jackson, uh, a an, uh, an, uh, world famous uh, uh, oceanographer and hydrologist, uh, one of said a couple of weeks ago when he was on a meeting in Den Helder, where I had the honor to speak as well. He said to uh, the, the 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 audience that you got the best hydrologist in the world, but it will all be in vain. <laughs> yeah. Um, I. So now we get to the optimism pessimism part. Um, uh, well, now let, let, let's keep this. So so we'll we'll get there eventually. So at the end, because. Um, uh, I would like to get into the, our university, uh, the Radboud University itself, uh, that's, that's going green. Um, to, yeah, how, how do you think the, the university is doing? Um, sustainable? <laughs> getting there? Mm. Do I really have to comment on that? <laughs> well, sure, I think. Is okay. yeah. um, what I do like about this place here, coming from other places, is that 
definitely there is much more awareness of the things and and people are more interested in it than I commonly see at other business schools. So it's much more of a topic. It's it's there is more discourse about it. Um, I mean, uh, my other university is a technical university. I'm sure we have green uh, initiatives as well, but we don't really see them coming as employees. So that is definitely something that I value here. But yeah, I would say there is still a long road to go. Yeah. G give us and, one. Um, uh, yeah, well, um, it, I like to be a spoil sport now in the national. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. But um, if we want to be green as a university, and then, then, then I would really ask all my colleagues not to attend all these international conferences, which they attend by uh, yeah. airplane, as you know. I know. And there yeah. you go. And the average uh, academic flies much more than the average citizen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. I also know there's a, there's a just a very concrete suggestion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, there 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 is a. Um, I That's think he's a sweet uh, um, a climate scientist who said, I will, I'll stop flying. I, I won't do it anymore. And he's trying to create some momentum and get other academics to Clive Hamilton, whom I mentioned yeah. in my lecture, has, uh, has claimed that he didn't fly. But uh, yeah. just a fortnight ago, he, he uh, offered a lecture in Germany. <laughs> so how the hell did this Australian guy get to Germany? Yeah. Ship. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. By ship. Yeah. yeah, and whether Which that is, is so much more polluted. sustainable, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> no, but to, so to, to to would that be a thing? Is is this just uh, you want to 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 get us thinking, academics or or? My friend Hank Osling once argued that that occasionally criticism is always hi uh, hypocriticism. Criticism. What he means by it is this obvious hint to uh, hypocritical. Yeah. But but occasionally we we um, we want to be critical of some practices, but in order to uh, uh, to to make our voice heard, we use the same practices. So you can be yeah. against internet, but the best way to 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 uh, allow yourself to to to, to yeah. make your voice heard is to use the internet. And uh, I, I once spoke to Naomi Klein, and she's probably somebody who flies more than anybody. And she's constantly warning against uh, flying, but she flies yeah. over all over the place and the yeah. planet. And that's why all criticism, according to uh, Hank, is, is somehow hypocritical as well. And that's okay. Yeah, there's nothing to be done about yeah. that. 